Good evening and welcome to Navara Live. I'm your host Ash Sarka, subbing in for Michael Walker, who's at Glastonbury with Aaron Bastani and Chow Ravens and Moya Lothian McLean to deliver some talks at Shangri-La. So if you're down there, go and say hello. But for those of you who aren't living it up in Somerset, look at me. I am the captain now. Joining me on this voyage is Mike Bancole. Mike, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. It's good to see us uh, matching in the All Black. We both got the, the All Black medal, which is good. Taking us back to Navarra's goth origins. Um, <laughs> as usual, you can tweet along using the hashtag Navarra Live or leave a comment in the chat. Do you think the government is going to let homeowners get screwed over just in time for the next election? Let's go to our first story. Yesterday, the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee hiked interest rates for the 13th time in a row to 5%. It's predicted that the base rates will hit 6% by the end of the year. And that means the price of borrowing, for example, for a mortgage or a personal loan, will go up. For homeowners coming to the end of their fixed rate term next year and having to remortgage, that means an average annual increase of nearly £3,000. Something that you'll hear a lot is that even with this most recent hike in the basic rate of interest, it's still a lot lower than rates in the 1990s and the 1980s. And that's certainly true, as you can see in this graph. After the financial crisis, interest rates were dropped to historic lows to try and keep asset prices afloat and people spending. But let's face it, it's not as if we've all been living the high life since 2008. Wages have been stagnant or falling, public spending slashed in key areas, and despite low interest rates making the 2010s the perfect time for governments to borrow to invest in infrastructure and job creation, they pursued slash and burn austerity instead. And even though the new base rate of 5% is a lot lower than the 13% of 1989, the fact is that people are having to spend a lot more money in order to buy a house. This is a tweet from George Eaton. Why interest rates rising in the 2020s is not the same as in the 1980s. UK house prices have increased by over 1,000% since 1980, so debt is much higher. Real wages have stagnated for over a decade. There is no mortgage interest tax relief. In 1983, the average house price was £26,000 and the average salary was £8,500. So it was about three times the average salary to buy the average house. But last year, the average house price rose to £280,000. The average salary was only £33,000. So the average house was over eight times the average salary, meaning that in reality, interest rates of 5% now are a lot higher than the equivalent number in previous decades because the debt is bigger. So what are the government going to do about it? The answer is not a lot. Today, Jeremy Hunt met with mortgage lenders to discuss what could be done for homeowners struggling with repayments under the new interest rates. And this is what was announced. Hunt said three measures had been agreed, including that consumers' credit scores would not be affected by discussions with their bank or mortgage lender, and that those agreeing to change the terms of their mortgage by switching to interest-only payments or extending the life of the loan could return to their original deal within the first six months. He said that for those who are at risk of losing their home in that extreme situation, a 12-month grace period would be introduced. Now, the small print here is that banks and building societies will only have to offer these terms to borrowers if they want to. So it's a much weaker proposition than Labour, who said they'd make the banks offer better terms by force of law. Jeremy Hunt has also offered this advice to struggling mortgage holders. The most significant thing is that they can pick up the phone to their bank or their mortgage lender and talk about their situation without any worry that it will impact their credit score. Pick up the phone to your bank. My God, I wish I'd thought of that. That's going to make my financial situation so much better. Not really. Jeremy Hunt's measures mean that people with poor credit scores or those who've previously been made bankrupt might not be able to switch onto a different mortgage deal. And that's something that's already happening to people who are coming to the end of their fixed rate term. The I has a particularly grim case of a woman whose repayments doubled overnight. In the article, they write this. 
Polly Arrowsmith, 56, lives in a one-bed flat in Islington, North London, and has 15 years left on her £320,000 mortgage. She was paying 2.79% until two months ago. Her four-year fixed rate deal came to an end, and she moved on to her lender's standard variable rate of 8.25%. It was unbelievable. My monthly mortgage payments rose from around £1,400 a month to £3,105 a month, she says. As a result, she is cutting back on groceries, using her savings to pay her mortgage, and is considering taking on a second job part-time. I have to step up my income generation. It's worth pointing out as well that none of the measures announced by the government have anything to say about renters who are also impacted by mortgages becoming more expensive. Already lumped with rent increases that have outpaced wages for the last 21 months in a row, tenants are vulnerable to landlords simply passing on the increased cost of their mortgage repayments. And most landlords are on interest-only mortgages, meaning that there isn't really a way for them to switch to a better deal. The options are to take the hit to their profits or pass the costs on to their tenants. I wonder which one they'll do. So where will people find that money, I hear you ask? Since the cost of living is going up much faster than wage growth, the answer proffered by the Bank of England and the government is basically, lol, you won't. Joining the Bank of England in poo-pooing pay rises, last night Rishi Sunak ruled out both public sector pay rises and tax cuts. Every time you hear from a politician or something else that means the government would be borrowing more money, that should be setting off an alarm bell in your heads, he said. If I did all those things, it might feel great for a day, for a week, for a month, and pretty quickly it will will turn out to have been a really bad idea. If you're thinking that making everybody poorer for the good of the economy isn't exactly a vote winner, you'd be right. Today, polling from Ipsos shows that 8 in 10 Brits are dissatisfied with how the government is running the country. And that goes up to 9 in 10 when they only asked people paying off their mortgages. While Labour still have a massive polling lead over the Conservatives in terms of voting intention, it's not like Keir Starmer as an individual is filling people with inspiration. That might have something to do with the fact that the public are overwhelmingly convinced that things are going to get worse over the next 12 months. Mike, this lack of optimism is really quite astonishing. Do you think that there's anything else that the government could be doing to regain the sense of political momentum? I think they've lost all momentum and I think this is a government that most people are aware of is going to not be in government beyond the next general election. I think they've lost the trust of the people over the last 13 years. I think both short and long term, the Conservatives, as they've been in power, have made really bad decisions. Whether it's Liz Trust budget from last year or even longer term, the fact the government's failed to transition us to a greener and more sustainable economy years and years ago, insulating homes, you know, things that many activist groups are calling for quite loudly. The fact that none of those things have been put in place means that we are where we are now, where, for example, we have the highest energy bills in the G7. So I think, you know, the Conservative governments have lost, you know, the, the will of the people. They've lost the... People aren't on their side anymore, and a lot of people are waiting for them to, to leave office. Now, I don't think Labour have all the solutions we need in terms of, you know, dealing with the economic situation, having a policy that favours or factors in renters, for example. So I'm not saying Labour have all of the solutions, but I think the Conservatives have lost that moment where they can all of a sudden regain the political momentum that they once had. I mean, I was going to ask you about what you made of Labour's policy platform. I mean, do you think that Keir Starmer almost doesn't have the incentive to offer anything more because he's looking at the polls, he sees a 20 to 22 point lead and he goes, I don't actually have to be offering anything significantly better. I just don't have to be as bad as these guys. And I think that's been Starmer's approach this whole time, right? Um, These guys are so bad, but if I'm just slightly more competent than them, then, you know, I'll be fine. I'm in office. I think Labour aren't stupid here. They know that the Conservatives have shot themselves in the foot and have done since Johnson's victory in 2019 almost. I mean, that was almost the beginning of the end for the Conservative Party in in that they elected a liar who lied and lied and lied, was incompetent, left office, and it's been disaster since then. So I think Starmer and Labour are confident because they know the Conservatives only have to exist for Labour to to win the election because they they are just so incompetent. We've reported a lot on the inhumane and cynical ways this government treats asylum seekers, from offshore barges to processing centres with outbreaks of disease and staffed by unqualified guards, 
It seems there's no limit to the misery Suella Braverman's home office is willing to inflict on those fleeing war and persecution. But a new story reveals that even those asylum seekers in need of medical care aren't exempt from the government's cruelty. The Guardian reports that the Home Office has been accused of abandoning at least 55 disabled asylum seekers in a former Essex care home. At least eight of them are paraplegics. Run by a private company, of course, the care home was turned into an asylum centre in November. But despite the residents' suffering conditions including blindness, loss of limbs, deafness and mobility issues, the home is run as a standard asylum centre. That means there are guards and receptionists, but no nurses, doctors or care workers. Wouldn't want to cut into those tasty profits now, would we? One asylum seeker told The Guardian this. Everybody is suffering in this place. It used to be a care home, but now there is no care. We are free to come and go, but to me, this place feels like an open prison. We have just been left here and abandoned. Many of those in the former care home travelled to the UK by small boat from conflict zones, including Afghanistan and Sudan, and were sent by the Home Office to the centre directly from the Manston Processing Centre. That was the Kent facility that was so overcrowded it resulted in a diphtheria outbreak, violence and even death. Conditions don't seem much better in the former care home. Just last week, an Iranian refugee died at the centre. The man had restricted mobility due to a series of strokes. Doctors had repeatedly insisted that he needed a wheelchair, but none ever turned up. Another man struggles to walk because he has three bullets in his ankle. Yet another has lost his toes while living in the centre due to diabetes. There's also a woman at the centre who's bedbound due to motor and sensory neuropathies. She's fallen three times while in the centre. On one occasion, she was left on the floor for 14 hours after security and reception staff said they couldn't pick her up because they weren't trained carers. She told The Guardian this, I can walk a little bit if I have help, but there is nobody to help me, so I am confined to my room most of the time. My feet have swollen badly because I'm not moving. The Guardian also spoke to a retired NHS worker who's been advocating for the asylum seekers. He told the paper that the cases he'd encountered in the centre were worse than any he'd seen in his 40-year career, adding this. Everyone has a major medical issue. It's all very well putting them in one place, like putting them in a dustbin and putting the lid on. But what they need is help. What's going on is unpardonable. The local council, which we won't name to protect the asylum seekers from right-wing nutjobs, has described the centre as, quote, unsuitable for the people housed there. The council spokesperson told The Guardian this, People placed here are vulnerable due to additional care needs and we have been doing what we can within our remit and the bounds of propriety to help them. We are not the commissioning authority or the funder for the services being provided on site. No, the commissioning authority is the Home Office, who appear to be doing absolutely nothing to help these residents. An organisation that is doing something is the charity refugee asylum seeker and migrant action. They've been supporting asylum seekers through their own funds, but have run out of money to provide clothing and disability equipment. Martha Wilby, who works for the charity, said this, It is cruel to stick these vulnerable people here in the middle of nowhere. We are literally watching them fall apart. So what does the Home Office have to say about the degrading treatment it's inflicting on these asylum seekers? A spokesperson for the department told The Guardian this, We are committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of those on asylum support, including people with disabilities. However, we do not operate care homes nor commission care as it is not within our statutory remit. Asylum accommodation providers are contractually obliged to ensure accommodation is accessible for disabled people and where concerns are raised, we work with providers to ensure they are addressed. It's just not my job, mate. But is that even true? Well, it's complicated, and that's because the English care system is set up in a way that allows local authorities, as well as central authorities like the Home Office, to dodge the bill for providing adequate care to those who need it. According to the Home Office, when it comes to asylum seekers, the local authority is where care need is first assessed, 
The local authority where a care need is first assessed is responsible for providing the asylum seeker with what they require. If these asylum seekers were first accommodated in Kent, then it seems that the responsible authority would be whichever accommodated them first. But, and it's a big but, the guidance goes on to say this. An authority that is accommodating someone in their care may also remain responsible if they move that person to another authority's care. So, if a Kent council moves the asylum seekers to an Essex council, the Kent council may remain responsible. But in this case, the Home Office moved them. And the guidance says nothing about who's responsible in that case. Of course, the Home Office is ultimately responsible for guidance that has care loopholes running right through it. Mike, one of the things that Suella Braverman says a lot is that there's a difference between illegal immigrants and genuine asylum seekers. That's their words, not mine. But these people are quite obviously and quite genuinely in need. So why aren't we taking care of them? Well, I think there are problems with the genuine and illegal uh, distinction because it places too much faith in the law, right? So it suggests that, because legality is, is defined by the law. So it suggests that, well, the law's been made in good faith. So those who are illegal deserve to be illegal. But actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. People can be made illegal overnight by changes in policy. And we also know that government policy on immigration isn't, you know, made or, or, or constructed in good faith and fight quite the opposite the, 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 this is a government in recent years that have you know pursued a hostile environment towards immig immigrants and that had knock-on effects in terms of the windrush generation who were viewed as illegal migrants overnight because of that policy so i actually always take exception to the illegal and genuine distinction that's often drawn by politicians and i think that ultimately what the reason why asylum seekers no matter if they're illegal or genuine are treated in ways that are dehumanised. And it's because for years and years, we've had political discourse, whether it's pushed by the media or by politicians themselves, that he's de dehumanised migrants. I mean, we, some people view them as less than human. I mean, there are so many stories about, you know, the conditions that migrants have been held in. And, and it's just, as a society, it feels like we're so dehumanised to this. Like we're, just so we're just so used to seeing this, this treatment, so desensitised to this treatment of, of, of migrants and asylum seekers. And that's partly because of our political culture, it's partly because of our societal culture. Um, and, and it's really, really disheartening to see. Just going to go to some comments in the YouTube chat. Shiny Warm says, this is hard to listen to without wanting to cry, to be honest. And Alexander Hall adds, always remember the Tories want this stuff to happen to migrants. And I think that's a really pertinent point, And it chimes very well with what Mike was saying, is that all of these horrific things that we're learning about, whether it's capsized boats in the English Channel or the horrible conditions at Manston, they're a product of government policy. So either not funding things like processing asylum claims quickly or actively funding things like the Rwanda deportation scheme, which makes conditions worse and harder across the board for really vulnerable people. And why are they doing that? It's because they've, you know, tied themselves to this mast of, okay, we're going to get immigration down to the tens of thousands. They can't do that because it would collapse our public services, collapse the economy, make everything worse for most people's living standards in this country. So instead, they like perform this pantomime of cruelty. And I wish it was make-believe. I wish it was just a sort of show for the papers, but it's not. It's actually impacting people's lives. Just when you thought it was safe to turn on your TV without being bombarded by Brexit debates, BBC Question Time decided to host a special episode last night assembling a panel of experts, politicians and pundits to discuss Britain leaving the EU. The audience was composed entirely of Leave voters in Clacton-on-Sea where 70% of people voted for Brexit. While some professed to have changed their minds since casting their votes in 2016, members of the panel, ranging from lifelong Brexiteers to ardent Remainers, seemed a little bit more set in their ways. Here's what Alistair Campbell had to say about how things have turned out since that fateful night seven years ago. You were lied to, I'm afraid. You were lied to. You were told that it would be pain-free. You were told that it would be all the upsides, no downsides. You'd be told that getting a deal would be easy, that it would be straightforward to leave. You were told that we'd get the money on the health service. And lots of the things that you were told would happen, such as a trade deal with the United States, have not happened. And lots of the things that you were told wouldn't happen, have happened. And I mentioned the, the, the loss of 10% in the value of the pound. We've not recovered from that. You were told there'd be more investment. 
investment has flatlined. We were told it would be a boost to productivity. Productivity has flatlined. Trade has been hammered. And I hear the story that this gentleman has told virtually everywhere I go, particularly from small businesses who are drowning in red tape. And I'm afraid that, look, I understand why a lot of you guys voted for Brexit, because you felt that Johnson, Farage, these con men were coming along, offering you something that was gonna make your lives better. And I was in a school today, just a few minutes away from here, Clacton Coastal Academy. Really bright kids, really nice teachers, fantastic school in a very tough area. And I asked the kids what they thought of Brexit, and all but two said they would vote to rejoin the European Union if they had the chance. That is a future that I'm afraid, I think this government, and I don't blame you for voting, I blame them for lying to you. They lied, they've not been properly held to account. Johnson's gone for lying about COVID. He's still not properly been held accountable for Brexit. And we're all of us paying a higher price in our cost of living and everything else because of the lies that we were told. Hmm. Okay, let's get into this. It's absolutely 100% the case that the Leave campaign said things which were untrue. Who can forget? You kept claiming that Turkey was about to join the EU. Then there was Boris Johnson cavorting in front of a big red bus. But to say that people only voted to leave the EU because they were hoodwinked and bamboozled is more than a little bit condescending. And of all the people to give a lecture about the importance of honesty in politics, Alistair Campbell would be the last person I'd ask. It's like getting a lesson in bedside manners from Harold Shipman. Now look, I personally voted Remain, but I think it's screamingly obvious that one big factor that played in Leave's favour was that nobody particularly trusted establishment politicians. And they had good reasons not to. If you want to talk about being led into disaster by liars and con men, I'd look no further than the Blair administration. Alistair Campbell was a master of spin, making the government's case by getting the media to report massaged, distorted and less than reliable information. The war in Iraq doesn't have many glorious achievements, but destroying public trust in politicians for a generation is certainly one of them. And in 2016, we were six years into the government's austerity program. People were getting poorer, they saw public services getting worse all around them, and worst of all, they were being told that it was all for their own good. And add to that an anti-immigration moral panic, which was gladly whipped up by many politicians on the Remain side. No wonder that many Leave voters felt that giving the government a good kick up the arse would shock them into doing something about the pervasive sense of national decline. And that's something that the likes of Alistair Campbell don't really want to talk about, that they helped create the conditions that made people vote for Brexit. It wasn't just me that found Campbell patronising. Here's what one woman had to say. Sorry, it just makes my blood boil when I keep hearing that same thing about the fact that we were lied to. Um, you know, that's just not the case. We didn't believe that. I certainly never believed that. I wanted out to be sovereign, to not be um, Absolutely right. encumbered by the I'm EU. <laughs> Mike, what do you make of this? Do you think it's worth trying to persuade Leave voters that they were misled or is it a bit condescending? I don't think it is at this stage, and, and I think positionality is key here. Let's not forget who Alistair Campbell is, as you kindly reminded us, Ash. She is someone that made his name as the spin doctor. So to, to him lecturing an audience about them being lied to is, is quite ironic. It's, it's hilarious, actually. And look, I think people are just over the issue of Brexit. I think we can talk about the consequences of Brexit and, and what's happening today as a result of Brexit. But the idea that we can speak to Lee voters and be like, you were wrong and you were lied to. It just feels a bit weird and condescending, especially, again, coming from Alistair Campbell. And I think, ultimately, the nation just wants to move on. Like, I remember in 2015, 2016, just how divisive the issue of Brexit was and just how horrible it was. Like, watching any political show around that time was a challenge because the debates would often happen in bad faith. There were so many lies being spouted. And it was, wasn't a very pleasant time in our politics. And... Look, Alistair Campbell, the, the Blair administration, like you said, created the conditions for Brexit because Brexit was in part an anti-establishment vote. I think many people who voted Leave 
were fed up with the nature of politics as it stood because they were lied to by administrations like the Blair administration. So I think it's important that, you know, Alistair Campbell remembers who he is and, and, and the, the government he represented before he lectures an audience about lying. I mean, I was thinking about this when I was watching the show, which is why would you want to reopen some of these wounds? I mean, I don't know. Do, do you feel that we're anywhere close to examining the consequences of Brexit or are we just stuck in replaying the same debates from seven years ago? I think from a BBC point of view, they realise that they probably did good numbers around the time of Brexit because the debates were so febrile. And you often get those nice little clips of someone who has an extreme view maybe on on leave, like there's a guy who said something about people come to this country and immediately are on benefits. That, like that sort of clip that goes viral on social media for a number of days, people are commenting. So I think BBC might have been keen to have this debate or have this show on for that reason. But like I think there are so many other topics we can we can focus on it and 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 analyze them more far away. It's like I think the climate emergency is one of the big issues of the day. And I haven't seen that debated forensically on Question Time, for example. I would love to see that debated forensically on Question Time and actually debates about the best course of action at this stage, given where we are with the climate emergency. Instead, our discourse on the climate emergency seems to be one where we frame those who are campaigning and advocating for a greener and, and better future. We, we, we frame these people as rascals who are threatening our stability as a nation. So, you know, I think the Brexit debate, and again, I think we can talk about the consequences of Brexit, and I don't think that that debate should be shut down. But the idea that we have leavers and remainers on one side and we put them together or we have leavers in one room and the next week we're going to have remainers on, it all feels very tired and very 2016. You stole the words right from my mouth, Mike, but you know what, I'm going to go ahead and repeat them anyway. Because you're right, it's a bit of an odd decision that BBC Question Time wanted to focus so intently on Brexit, especially with an audience that only had leave voters. So usually what happens is that question time try to get an audience that reflects the political composition of the country at large based on their voting behaviour. And while I think it's definitely interesting, it's meaningful, it's good to find out what Leave voters make of Brexit, it's not exactly representative of the entirety of the UK. And what's more, Brexit isn't ranking all that high in the list of the public's priorities right now. This is polling from YouGov. The bright turquoise line is only at 19%. So more people think that the environment, immigration, healthcare and the economy are all the most important things facing the country today, whereas only 19% of people think that Brexit is. And sure, you can argue that Brexit has a relationship to some of those things, but it's just not a super pressing political issue at the front of people's minds right now. In fact, it's so far down the list of priorities that the government didn't even see fit to put up one of their ministers for the question time panel. So, Mike, why do you think that the BBC are reopening this distinction right now? Because there are lots of other kinds of polarised debate and the BBC did very good numbers, as you pointed out, when it was Brexit. But they also did good numbers when it was, you know, socialism versus austerity. There's all kinds of things which are quite polarised. Do you think they're a bit out of touch and behind the curve or do you think it's maybe an attempt to paper over some of these bigger economic differences in the country? I think it just represents the general poverty of, of good quality political um, shows out there. I mean, Navarra's exist partly because of this, right? Because in the mainstream, the discussion just seems to be either conducted in bad faith or just years and years behind the general the general curve. So I, I, I don't know why we've reopened this debate. I don't know why we're talking about leave and remain. If we're going to focus on Brexit again, the conversation should be about, you know, the consequences, whether it's worked or not. Not about, you know, leavers being condescended and being told they were wrong. You know, wherever you stood on the debate, I think a lot of people have just moved on. Like I said, it was so febrile in 2016. Like I remember, I think I had to stop watching Question Time around that time because it was just... It was just so horrible. You'd have these disgusting comments made about immigration by members of the audience. You'd have those lines parroted by members of the, of the of the panel. It just wasn't very pleasant. So look, maybe, like I said earlier, the BBC are looking for their little clips and their social media highlights. Because look, BBC are aware of this. It's like when I spoke a, a few weeks ago in Navarra about Mizzy and how he was being afforded a platform. I think 
a lot of media companies are aware of what does and doesn't get them clicks. And they do often chase those clicks. So they, they do often act in bad faith. And I think this is another bad faith editorial decision by the BBC who are trying to get some clicks. I mean, I also think that it reflects some of the preoccupations of the people who work at the BBC, work at Mentor and Media, and form part of that class strata. Because someone who shall remain nameless, but who I interact with relatively often through doing a bit of work for Radio 4, is really obsessed by Brexit and what it's doing to the country in the sense that it was this act of national sense heart this act of national self-harm and he's constantly wanting to go let's debate this again let's debate this again let's debate this again and I was like sure this this thing you know I can agree with you that it was really bad but there's much worse things going on right now you know 2016 is not the low point of British politics that would be austerity that would be Iraq that would be you know, the private rental sector and how it's impoverishing millions of this country's workers. But Brexit was the thing that impacted him and his sense of political status and his idea of who it is that makes decisions and how. And so that's why it felt like the single most important issue of the day. And there was that brilliant Gavin Jacobson article in the New Statesman about the Waterstones dad, the centrist dad who's always in the Waterstones reading books about why is Westminster so fucked? And it defines political dysfunction in such narrow terms that you're only really talking about Boris Johnson and the norms that govern this really narrow band of politics and you're not talking about these much bigger economic distinctions. Um, And the last thing that I'd want to say is to agree with you completely, Mike, which is that I think that climate change should be covered in that kind of breathless minute by minute way that Brexit was, because I think you can tell a lot about what's considered an important political issue by what politicians are allowed to give bad answers to. So between 2016 and 2020, a politician couldn't get away with a bad answer on Brexit. They'd be hounded, they'd be doorstopped. If they tried to fudge or to prevaricate, the media would pounce on them. Same with the anti-Semitism crisis. If you gave anything other than the single most reductive crystal clear answer, you'd get hounded. But for climate change, politicians can just be like, eh, something will happen, I guess. And everyone accepts it. And that shows you that it's ranked quite low in political media's priorities, but not ours, not at Navarra Media. The world spent the last four days watching the unfolding horror of the Titan submarine disaster. That's after the media spun out a story against a ticking clock, literally counting down the hours of oxygen they said was left for the five passengers aboard the vessel. Now we know that the Titan submarine, an experimental craft that was unregistered, unclassified by experts and unregulated, imploded shortly after beginning its 2.4 mile descent to the wreck of the Titanic. On Thursday afternoon, the Coast Guard announced that it had discovered, quote, major pieces of the Titan submersible on the seabed about half a kilometer away from the Titanic. But the US Navy now reports that it picked up sounds of an implosion soon after the Titan lost contact on Sunday. The five passengers on board are likely to have died instantly, too quickly to have even been aware of what was happening. So who were they? 77-year-old Paul-Henri Nargiolet, also known as Mr. Titanic, was a French deep-sea diver and Titanic expert. Also on board was 58-year-old Hamish Harding, the British-born billionaire who lived in Dubai where his aviation business was based, was a thrill seeker, having also gone into space with Jeff Bezos' Blue Origins mission last year. 48-year-old Shahzada Dawood was a businessman from one of Pakistan's wealthiest families. Another billionaire, he lived with his family in Surbiton, London. Suleiman Dawood was Shahzada's 19-year-old son. A student at Strathclyde University where he was studying business, Suleiman enjoyed science fiction, volleyball and Rubik's Cubes. Speaking to Sky News after news of the implosion, his aunt Azem Dawood revealed this. That's the thing about Suleiman. He had a sense about things and he had a sense that this was not, this was not okay. And he just, he was not very comfortable about doing it. He was very, very not into doing it, but 
it was a Father's Day thing. It was a bonding experience. And, you know, he wanted the adventure of a lifetime, just like his father did. That's just horrific. I think all of us can relate to the idea of doing something we don't want to out of love for somebody close to us. And the idea that it resulted in such a dreadful end for someone whose life was just beginning, really, is awful. The last person on board was 61-year-old Stockton Rush. He was CEO of Ocean Gate, the firm that developed the Titan Submersible, and ran $250,000 per person tours to the Titanic wreck. Rush, though, was not a fan of safety regulations. In a 2019 interview, the year that the Titan was launched, he said this. At some point, safety is just pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed. Don't get in your car. Don't do anything. At some point, you're going to take some risk, and it really is a risk-reward question. I think I can do this just as safely while breaking the rules. And in a further interview that year, he said this. There hasn't been an injury in the commercial sub industry in over 35 years. It's obscenely safe because they have all these regulations, but it also hasn't innovated or grown because they have all these safety regulations. This was Rush speaking in an interview just last year. I'd like to be remembered as an innovator. Um, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. And you know, I've broken some rules to make this, I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. It's picking the rules that you break that are the ones that will add value to others and add value to society. And that really, to me, is about innovation. It's taking, it's not invention. You know, innovation is when you take an invention and you make it, you know, accepted broadly. And maybe think of ocean exploration the way everybody thinks of space exploration. Yes space exploration, that industry where Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson will fling you out of the atmosphere on a wing in a prayer. OceanGate had previously found itself in trouble over its reluctance to allow external experts to ratify its vessels. In 2018, David Lockridge was OceanGate's director of marine operations. Before Titan's initial launch, he produced a scathing report that stressed quote, the potential dangers to passengers of the Titan as the submersible reached extreme depths. But Rush refused to have the Titan inspected and certified by leading experts. The New York Times reports this. Mr. Lockridge reported in court records that he had urged the company to do so, but that he had been told that OceanGate was unwilling to pay for such an assessment. After getting Mr. Lockridge's report, the company's leaders had a tense meeting to discuss the situation, according to court documents filed by both sides. The documents came in a lawsuit that OceanGate filed against Mr. Lockridge in 2018, accusing him of sharing confidential information outside the company. In the documents, Mr. Lockridge reported learning that the viewport that lets passengers see outside the craft was only certified to work in depths of up to 1,300 metres. That is far less than would be necessary for trips to the Titanic, which is nearly 4,000 metres below the ocean's surface. The paying passengers would not be aware and would not be informed of this experimental design, lawyers for Mr. Lockridge wrote in a court filing. There were warnings from others as well. Also in 2018, nearly 40 oceanographers, industry experts and deep sea explorers signed a letter urging Rush to allow experts to monitor the testing of the Titan. Of, in these excerpts from that letter, DNVGL refers to a submersible risk assessment. Our apprehension is that the current experimental approach adopted by OceanGate could result in negative outcomes from minor to catastrophic that would have serious consequences for everyone in the industry. Your marketing material advertises that the Titan design will meet or exceed the DNVGL safety safety standards. Yet it does not appear that OceanGate has the intention of following DNVGL class rules. Your representation is at minimum misleading to the public and breaches an industry-wide professional code of conduct we all endeavour to uphold. While this may demand additional time and expense, it is our unanimous view that this validation process by a third party is a critical component in the safeguards that protect all submersible occupants. 
According to the letter's signatories, Rush called him after receiving it and told him that industry standards were stifling innovation in the industry. In December last year, CBS journalist David Pogue joined a Titan expedition. This was him before the deep sea dive began. The star of the show is the Titan, Stockton Rush's custom-built submersible. Five-inch thick carbon fiber capped on each end by a dome of titanium. If all went well, I myself would be spending about 12 hours sealed inside on a dive to the Titanic. Not gonna lie, I was a little nervous. An experimental submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Where do I sign? Here's what he had to say about the sub's advanced technology. Take your shoes off, that's customary. Okay. Wow. Inside, the sub has about as much room as a minivan. So this is not your grandfather's submersible. <laughs> we only have one button, that's it. It should be like an elevator. You know, it shouldn't take a lot of skill. The Titan is the only five-person sub in the world that can reach titanic depths, 2.4 miles below the sea. It's also the only one with a toilet, sort of. And yet I couldn't help noticing how many pieces of this sub seemed improvised. We can use these off-the-shelf components. I got these from uh, Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> Come on! It seems like this submersible has some elements of MacGyvery jerry rigness. I mean, you're putting construction pipes as ballast. I don't know if I'd use that description of it, um, but there's certain things that you want to be uh, buttoned down. So the pressure vessel is not MacGyver at all because that's where we work with Boeing and NASA and the University of Washington. Everything else can fail. Your thrusters can go, your lights can go, you're still gonna be safe. On Pogue's trip, several dive attempts were abandoned, but eventually it seemed to be about to happen. That's when Pogue learned more about the futuristic tech that had his life in its hands. The dive was a go. Titan sitting at 3742 meters reports on bottom. But that was the last of the good news. And I said, do you know where we are? 100 meters to the bow, then 470 to the bow. If you are lost, so are we. There's no GPS underwater. So the surface ship is supposed to guide the sub to the shipwreck by sending text messages. Turn 30 degrees right? Probably, yeah, 30 degrees. But on this dive, communications somehow broke down. The sub never found the wreck. You heard that right. Text messages. They were relying on text messages. I can't even get a text back from people I date. And yet I'm going to rely on getting them from a ship so that I can emerge unharmed and unscathed from depths of miles under the ocean. Talk about innovation. That journalist did eventually get to the Titanic on the submersible's last effort. The Titan is now on the bottom of the ocean. The bodies of its passengers will never be recovered. There's a tragic irony here. The innovations in the Titanic's hull were believed to render it unsinkable, so much so that warnings of a nearby iceberg were ignored, leading to the deaths of hundreds. Warnings were also ignored by the owners of the Titan as well as their customers, costing its disruptor CEO and super wealthy passengers their lives as well. Mike, is this a classic story of a lack of regulation leading to the loss of life? I think it is. And the fact that this was so avoidable makes it really hard to stomach because there were warnings. And I think the CEO of, o of Ocean Gate, as you pointed out, was very reluctant to have his innovation curtailed by regulation. But if he was more open to regulation, it's very likely that these lives would not have been lost. You know, so I think much like we have in the aviation industry, for example, where there are you know, regulations on what can and can't be, be allowed to fly. There should be, you know, tighter regulations on what can and can't go underwater, especially when, you know, we know the, the, the chances of, of death and, and the risk is so, so high. So it really is sad. And it's just, it, I've struggled to kind of like engage with story partly because the more I read, the more avoidable I know it is. And it's just like, this is all just, is, is really sad. While the search was underway for the Titan and admits the media clamor to capture every detail of the grim story, I posted this on social media. The Titanic submarine is a modern morality tale of what happens when you have too much money and the grotesque inequality of sympathy, attention, and aid for those without it. 
Migrants are meant to die at sea. Billionaires aren't. The backlash from some quarters was intense. Paragon of Compassion, Piers Morgan, posted this. Actually, the real morality tale from this is how horrifically non-compassionate you hashtag be kind woke mob can be. That really was just boomer word salad there. And this was from TV presenter Richard Bacon. No, stop it. It's totally legitimate to say it's mad we don't put this empathy onto migrant boats. Totally legitimate, but don't dehumanize these people. There's a kid on there who's a student in Glasgow. Today his mum lost him and her husband after awful hours of false hope. Those are just two examples of criticism, and I'm not going to get into talking about the abuse and threats because I think there's a really important distinction to be made between criticism, which while I disagree with it, I think it's totally legitimate to express it, and stuff which is actively meant to frighten and silence people. So I thought I would share what I actually think about this whole thing. I think that what happened to those five individuals was absolutely dreadful. It's a terrifying and grim way to die, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I also think that it was absolutely avoidable. Human beings have always pushed boundaries in the name of exploration and scientific discovery, but that isn't what happened here. OceanGate thought they were smarter than the regulators. They were disdainful of safety constraints and industry best practice, And that's because they wanted to make deep sea tourism commercially viable before anybody else could. That is, in anybody's book, the very definition of hubris. And I do think that their modus operandi as a company was appealing to the vanity and the recklessness of some very rich people. Tapping into the idea that if you've got enough money you should be able to have access to any and every forbidden shore. And there's a morality tale here, one that echoes the tragedy of the Titanic itself. A group of people think they know better than everyone else, that they can disregard safety regulations, and that ultimately leads to a tragic and preventable loss of life. It also has shades of the Icarus myth flying too close to the sun against all warnings and perishing in the attempt. I think that one of the reasons that people in the media are so angry at me, other than every good story needs a good hate figure, is that the moral of this tale is so blindingly obvious. Money doesn't make you a more intelligent or responsible person, and in fact, it can give you a dangerous sense of your own invulnerability and indeed a sense of arrogance. It can make people wasteful and heedless and reckless with the lives of those entrusted to their care. And the minute, the minute you begin to point out the judgment warping nature of extreme wealth, well, there must be something evil and vicious about you. Mike, am I being a bit unfair here. Should we keep the Ocean Gate fiasco totally free of critical political commentary? I don't think we can. I think I have a a good friend who always tells me that everything is political. No matter what we say or do about it, these things are inherently political. And, you know, again, I think we can mourn the loss of life as as you have done, Ash, and have you spoken eloquently there, while also reflecting on the political implications and the conditions that allowed this to happen. And I think the point in your initial tweet about the attention is received and we had these countdowns about you know when the auction was going to run out and all of this sort of thing versus the lack of attention paid to other stories is an important one because we spoke we spoke earlier in the show about the asylum seekers and and how you know they are constantly dehumanized by the press and also their plight often isn't front page news partly because we're so used to their plights right so a number of, of boats carrying migrants over the last few days have capsized now, but this has been mentioned a couple of times in the news. You know, BBC wrote an article about, about the most recent incidents, I believe. But this hasn't received the kind of front-to-back, you know, coverage that this story has received. And I think that was a, a fair point that you made. So I think we can mourn the loss of life as a result of this tragedy, while also reflecting on the fact that this story has disproportionately dominated the news in ways that other stories, which are equally worthy of dominating the news, haven't. And that is a political decision. So everything is political. Totally agree with you. Everything is political. Um, and I also, I also think that there is a kind of false equivalence 
being drawn here, which is, well, you want to mourn the deaths of these refugees and yet you don't want to mourn um, the billionaires who, who died in the submarine accident. Now, I'm not saying, of course I'm not saying that those lives shouldn't be mourned. Um, they're human beings. They've got families, they've got loved ones, they've got people who are being torn apart by grief right now. But I think that there's a false equivalence going on here, which allows us to sort of drape this with the cloak of vulnerability and desperation. Now, they were vulnerable because they were in an exceptionally dangerous place, but the difference between being in an unseaworthy vessel because you're fleeing war and persecution and the borders of Fortress Europe won't let you find safety on our shores and paying $250,000 for a very, very risky experience in an unclassified and unregulated submarine. And I think that we have to look at the role of money in making people take some of these risks. Now, Navarra Media only exists because of people like you. People watching, reading, and listening to our reportage. We are, quite literally, a people-powered media company. So, if you can, we'd love you to donate one hour's wage per, per month or whatever you can afford to help fund truthful and truly independent media. You can find the link to our support page in the description. It's the scoop of the century. An old university friend of Keir Starmer lifted the lid on the Labour leader's criminal past, revealing that he had been caught by French coppers illegally selling ice creams on a Mediterranean beach. Speaking to Politico's Westminster Insider podcast, John Murray spilled Liz Haricot terrible pronunciation, so sorry, about a holiday that they had taken as students in the 1980s. We spent a month as almost beach bums selling ice creams to tourists and making about four francs a day, Murray told the podcast. The place was overrun with other beach sellers because they'd all been suckered into thinking they'd earn hundreds of pounds a day. And then we found out it was actually not legal. So we spent our time kind of avoiding being arrested. To be honest, I did get arrested, but all that happened was you had your ice creams confiscated, got a receipt, and then had to walk back to the beach without your flip-flops. When pressed by journalists, a Labour spokesperson said, We are happy to make clear that no arrests were made or even names taken, and that the only loss of liberty occurred to some cut-price ice creams. Now, this is the kind of thing that is harmless and mischievous and it makes for an interesting tidbit about politicians. It humanizes them, it makes them seem a bit less stuck up and a lot more normal. And everyone has a bit of a laugh. A Labour spokesperson gets to issue a cheeky comment and everyone goes home happy. It's not exactly the stuff of true crime podcasts. But that wasn't the view taken by Keir Starmer as Director of Public Prosecutions when a man was sentenced to over a year in prison for stealing an ice cream during the 2011 riots. Anderson Fernandez walked into a dessert shop after finding the door open. He took two scoops but did not like the coffee flavour and he gave it to a passing woman. After serving his sentence, he was threatened with deportation to Portugal, a country he hadn't been to since he was a young child, and he faced a ban from the UK of 10 years. As Director of Public Prosecutions, Keir Starmer could have made the decision that it wouldn't be in the public interest to prosecute someone for such a low-level offence. After all, he himself had been involved with some unlawful gelato as a young man. But instead, Starmer took a very aggressive line in prosecuting offences committed during the riots. The pressure for tough justice meant for some the pressure for tough justice meant some first-time offenders were imprisoned for the pettiest of crimes, including stealing bottles of Evian and multi-packs of crisps. Nicholas Robinson, a 23-year-old electrical engineering student with no previous convictions, was sentenced to six months for stealing £3.50 worth of water from Lidl in Brixton. A sixth-form student got 10 months for looting two left-footed trainers in Wolverhampton. Some of the rioters' sentences were four times as long as those of people who committed equivalent offences in 2010. Half the rioters who appeared before the courts were under the age of 20, and just over a quarter were technically children. So, Mike, how do you think Keir Starmer, the Director of Public Prosecutions, might have looked at Keir Starmer, the ice cream selling student? Well, he would have been locked away and the key would have been thrown away while he was at it. I think we have to remember that Starmer took a very punitive approach following the London riots as Director of Public Prosecutions. I mean, we had all night courts to prosecute people for these really petty crimes. And I think Starmer has taken this really tough 
law and order approach. I mean, earlier this year, you were speaking about how thugs are running rampant on our streets and creating a more panic about crime. And again, I'm not suggesting crime isn't an issue in this country. Of course it is. But I think for someone who in his past was slightly mischievous, um, it's it's funny that, you know, he's adopted this kind of tough law and order stance that, you know, kind of seems to exa ex exaggerate the, the nature of crime in this country. So, so I think Starmer wouldn't have looked very kindly on on a young Starmer and his mischievous behaviour when it comes to gelato. Um, and I think it's just all a bit silly, really. I don't think we need to create these moral panics about crime. And I think, you know, yes, you know, people should be should face some consequences for the stuff they do. But some of these harsh sentences that he awarded, as uh, uh, he was kind of a source of the public prosecutions, you know, were over the top. I mean, I think this also reflects this really deep hypocrisy in what we want from politicians. So Kistama keeps being asked, did you try drugs at uni? And he'll respond in this kind of mischievous way, I had a good time. And then I don't know if you remember this from the Tory leadership race back in the day, everyone was falling over themselves to talk about how they'd done drugs. So you had Rory Stewart saying that he'd tried opium. You've got someone else saying that he'd had a bang lassie once. And then you had Andrea Leadsom saying she'd smoke to join. And that's the one that I didn't believe. I was like, no, you fucking didn't. You never have in your entire life. And it's this idea that we want politicians to have lived a life and done some stuff which is illegal or considered antisocial. And it shows that they're human like the rest of us. But then when the rest of us do it, we want sentencing, we want being locked up, throw away the key, we want ankle tags, we want asbos, we want monitoring. I mean, do you think that the journalists asking these kinds of questions are aware of the hypocrisy or does it just not really cross their minds? I don't think it crosses their minds. And it's, it is really funny, but it's rumble for them, rumble for us. So like, you know, a politician can boast about how they, they smoked weed and, and took drugs when they were at university. But if a member of the public does that, it's like, look, I got you. Look, you're a delinquent, you're this, you're that. You're labelled as this kind of criminal. But when they do it, it's like, ah, I was having fun. I was having a good time. You know, I was at Cambridge, smoking some joints, as you, as you do at Cambridge. So I do think this kind of hypocrisy in the political class is really grating on the public. And again, it's at least to this real division between us and them, because members of the public are like, well, actually, you guys can boast about it. But when members of the public are seen doing it, you, you, you want to throw the key away and lock them in prison forever. So I think the political class and the journalistic class need to kind of look within themselves and, and stop being hypocrites, essentially. What I've always wanted to do when I'm on a panel, like for Question Time of Politics Live and there's a drug story, is be like, put your hand up if you've tried drugs. Um, it's never yet come up, but I'm going to do it one of these days, just you watch. Um, thank you, Mike, for joining me tonight. It has been so great having you. Always a pleasure, Ash. Michael Walker, who? Um, and thanks everyone for watching this evening. Come back on Monday for another live stream from 6pm. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.